run out of time again. This happens every time. We just chat endlessly, you know, for half an hour, and then before you know it, the stopwatches is winding down and we're going to run out of time. Well, do you know what? I think we've run out of time. We haven't got time for any questions or anything. We've talked too much about meadows and grafting and show and tell and flow mode. I cannot believe where the time has gone. I've only got a couple of minutes left and we really should fit in one question. And with that, we've basically run out of time. Oh, sorry. <laughs>Welcome to a bit of a bumper bonus edition of Talking Dirty. We've had so many questions and we never seem to have time to answer them. We thought we would do a postbag edition. So over at East Ruston Old Vicarage, we have Alan, Edward, Herbert Gray, Herbert the happy, handsome and extremely knowledgeable horticulturalist. And over in Cambridge, we have Thordis, Maria Sophia Friedrichsen who is um, a gardener. I think she's an extraordinary gardener, really, because although she's really still learning, I mean, well, I say still learning, but we're all still learning because you never, you never know at all. Um, and we're all finding new plants the whole time. She's so enthusiastic, it, it beggars belief. Don't you know? Fortunately, I get to spend time every week just trying to absorb as much as I can from Herbert. And I'm going to do a bit more now by bringing some of the questions we've had coming in. Now, first one is from Ali, and you can email. So several of you have been emailing so that you can send us photos. It's hello at getgardeningnow.co.uk to email. Ali attached some photos of a lavender and a sedum in his garden, which are both looking a bit yellow. He's wondering if his nightly watering has has given them a bit too much of a drink and whether that is the cause for their yellowing he's a little bit at odds with his wife joanne because he wants to grow vegetables and she wants to grow flowers um so that their garden is pretty so i think alan um i think ali is suggesting he's a little out of his depth alan well he's not really because um it's quite a simple thing that when you have when you grow lavender um, and I, he says he thinks the lavender is hidcut. I'd looked at this a couple of days ago and he says he thinks it's hidcut. I would probably beg to differ because I think it's a bit too big for hidcut. But lavender, when it's got to the stage that it has in Ali's garden now, and it's, it's, the flowers have gone over, he needs to give it a trim, but trim it lightly. Trim it back by probably about a third to half, but don't trim back into the old wood because lavender doesn't regenerate. And you have to do that all the time to keep it fresh. And of course, do bear in mind that lavender is a Mediterranean plant and so benefits from growing in a very free drainy, sandy soil and it must have full sun. So don't let plants over, uh, grow over it because it won't like that either. Um, the sedum, I think probably the sedum too is a bit overwatered because you don't need to water plants like lavenders or sedum because lavender is a Mediterranean plant anyway and it has evolved to grow in very dry areas as has the sedum because if you look at the structure of a sedum its stems and its leaves are very thick and they're full, full, full of water so it doesn't need to, to actually be watered like mad and I think that um, Ali's sedum is showing the signs of a little bit too enthusiastic watering the other thing I'd say about sedums is it's quite useful if you don't want them to grow too vigorous because if they grow too vigorous, they, the clump falls apart and it shows its bare middle, which is not a good look for any of us. Um, <laughs> so to prevent that happening, you could do two things. As it comes into growth in, um, shall we say, March, you can stick a fork underneath it and just lift it out of the ground and break its, some of its roots and then push it back again. That will set it back a little bit. Or you can get to the, to the end of May and give it the Chelsea chop. Chop all of its stems back by half. It will shoot again from the leaf nodes and it will be, be much more compact. Is that something you picked up from the inimitable Beth Chateau? It is. I said to her, why are your sedums looking so lovely and mine are looking rather disgusting? And she said, you didn't chop it back, did you? And I said, no. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> So we've all lived and learned with that one. Sedums, Chelsea Chop, they'll be much more fulsome. On to oak trees now, because Sid also emailed in, really enjoying the new show, he says. Hi, dirty talkers. Please, can you help with my oak seedling? It's a couple of years old, and though most of the lower leaves are still green and healthy, the tallest shoots and leaves have all started to turn pale brown and they're papery thin. I hope to grow it into a large bonsai eventually. Thanks in advance and stay safe, says Sid. Well, Sid, I'm going to talk dirty to you straight away because I'm going to think that you're 
<laughs> the cause of your oak leaves turning papery is anthracnose. Now, if you haven't heard a dirt word dirtier than that, you haven't lived. But anyway, anthracnose, it's nothing really to worry about. It doesn't really kill oak trees, but it just affects their foliage. And it's, it's caused by the way it's cultivated. You know, all I can say to you is you've got to improve your method of cultivation. So just think water, feed and mulch. And if you can keep that plant so it's growing in, I hate this terminology, but all horticulturalists use it, moist but well-drained soil. That's what it wants, because it wants to have air in the soil as much as anything. And I think it's lack of air in the soil largely that causes, that causes anthracnose. How hard is it, incidentally, to, to turn things into a bonsai? Uh, relatively easy, once you get the um, idea of how you're going to do it. And I, I would advise anybody, if they want to do it, I mean, go online and have a look, because there are numerous tu 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 tutorials that you can look at. Um, and there are also books that you can, you can um, buy and look at those as well. Um, or you can, I mean, there's a very good bonsai club in Norwich, I know, or in Norfolk anyway. Um, and, you know, that teach you how to do it. But basically what you're doing is you're changing the habit of the growth of that plant by pruning its roots. You're keeping its roots confined. Do you remember in the, no, you wouldn't remember, I don't remember, but I've heard it from history in the 15th and 16th century. <laughs> Chinese ladies, if they were ladies of quality, they had their feet bound tightly so they didn't grow and they had the tiniest deformed feet and they couldn't walk um, because you know they were aristocratic and they didn't need to walk, they were carried everywhere. Um, and that was a sign of, uh, you know, the way you can change things. And basically bonsai is like binding its feet because what you're doing is you're combining the roots into a very, very tiny space. And once a year, you take as much of the soil off those roots when you take them out of the pot and you cut lots of those roots away. So you're starving the plant. The other work, thing that you do to make it into um, a picturesque, skeletal form shall we say is when the when the shoots on the tree are young that means still pliable you wrap them around traditionally people use copper wire but you can use aluminium wire which you can get from florists today and you tw twirl it around the shoot very carefully and then you bend that shoot into the shape of an old branch like a curve or you bend the trunk to curve one way and then perhaps the other and it's all in the artistry of the mind that you know the person that's creating the bonsai but it's not difficult to do it's just very time consuming um, and you need patience. Would have been a good lockdown project, wouldn't it? <laughs> if lockdown lasts five years, yes. <laughs> um, Phil got in touch about his honesty plants. He sent us a picture showing them looking a little bit worse to wear. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Phil could be a lady. <laughs> well, that's, that is true. Phil could Philippa, be. Philippa? Phil, Philippa? Phyllis? <laughs> Philip? <laughs> Fill your bucket. Come on. <laughs> So we've got a picture of some honesty plants looking a bit worse for wear. Much of it is caterpillar damage, but some of the leaves have wilted badly. So Phil, of whichever gender Phil is, wonders, are they OK? And Phil is keen to move the honesty plants. Is now a good time? Yes, now is a good time to move honesty. In, in actual fact, if you've got self-sown honesty in the garden and you want to move it and, and put, make another colony somewhere else or, you know, make somewhere um, a little bit more colourful very early in the year, now's a good time to do it. Um, regarding his honesty plants, I, I just wonder when he took the photograph because we've recently had a period of drought which was broken about a week ago with some very, very heavy rains and then we had wind and all the rest of it. Caterpillar damage, we don't need to worry about that because we know what it is. But the, the wilting leaves could be um, something wrong with the roots. I mean, something could be eating the roots. A pesky little bug of some sort could be eating the roots. So I think what I would do is I would actually don't investigate the roots straight away, but water the plants well two days before you're going to move them. And when you move them, just see that they have got a good root ball. If they've got a good root ball, then it's just lack of water that's made them wilt. And you don't need to worry about it. If, if the root ball is... Um, shall we say, gnawed or non-existent, then you need to do, do something about it. And I think the best thing that I would do to try and save the plants is to root wash them, get a bucket of water, wash the roots off of all the soil, and then replant them and keep them moist. Uh, make sure you puddle them in so the roots are in contact with new soil, puddle them in, and hopefully they will survive. 
There's been a lot of talk of meadows on this podcast, not least because we had Steve Colkill, head gardener at King's College, Cambridge, where they'd famously planted up that meadow, which would have just been a mown lawn by, uh, by the chapel, that famous view of the Cambridge backs. Joe got in touch, and now Joe is looking after a large meadow and is keen to introduce yellow rattle, of course, that kind of parasitic plant that weakens the grass. So Joe obviously wants to use that yellow rattle to help control the grasses, and a farmer who helps him suggested using his cedar to go over the closely cut meadow and get the seed in. Have you got any thoughts on that, whether that would work? I think an awful lot of seed probably would be wasted if you did that. I mean, I would prefer, I mean, I don't know how big Joe's meadow is, but it, it sounds as if it's pretty substantial if he can get a cedar in there. If the cedar is of the kind where it gets the, so the seed into the soil and not just leaves it on the surface, then that would be a good idea. I mean, if people wanted to do it on a domestic situation, I would advise them to buy plug plants of, of yellow rattle and insert them, roots and all, into, into, the, um, into the meadow. But other than that, I think you need to get that sort of the seed of real yellow rattle covered for the optimum performance. So it needs to get into the soil. Uh, really, yes. Yeah. And finally, um, Blue Magilla got in touch on YouTube because you can either email, you can, technically you can tweet us, though I always worry they'll get lost if you tweet us at Get Gardening Now, but you can comment on our podcasts on YouTube as well if you want to pop a question there. And Blue Magilla did that saying, such a pleasure to see your show. You can come again, Blue Magilla. Uh, now they have a question about growing flag lily and crocosmia seeds. How long will they take to flower? Because I've grown a few trays of seeds um, that I collected over the last couple of years and I have lovely foliage but I think Blue Magilla is keen to see some flowers soon and they're based yes, in Vancouver. Where is Blue Magilla, do we in, know? In Vancouver. Yes, exactly. That, that has a, that has a, um, <clears throat> an influence because Vancouver, uh, there used to be a very famous garden in Vancouver, I can't remember the man's name, but he, uh, they have a very short growing summer season um, and so therefore probably that is part of the reason why she hasn't got any flowers or he hasn't got any flowers on the crocosmia. Crocosmia normally take two to four years to get flowering sized plants, depending on how well they're grown. And what you need to do is you need to plant your, your, your extra seedlings into single flower pots. So if you've got 2000, that's a hell of a job, honey. <coughs> and you've got to keep those crocosmias um, safe from the very, very hard winters as well, because they won't like that. But if you do that, you should get flowers in two to four years. And she also mentioned something called the flag lily, which is, I think, Hesperantha. I've never seen Hesperantha actually make seed. But if she's got some Hesperantha seed, well, then go for it. And I would say, again, two to four years from sowing the seed to, to getting a flowering sized plant. But in if Vancouver, I would suggest that perhaps you need to keep those seedlings um, under cover for the winter. If you would like to ask a question, there are all manner of ways you can do it. So easy to attach a photo and send it in an email to hello at getgardeningnow.co.uk. Or if a question comes to mind while you're watching one of our podcast videos, just pop it in the comments section and we'll do our best to answer it either at the end of one of our podcasts with our guests or possibly in another postbag edition. But thank you for sending the questions in and thank you, Alan, for sharing your vast knowledge. <laughs> it's my pleasure. It's lovely to see you and it's nice to have so much time to chat. I know. <laughs> have a lovely day. Thank you. Bye bye. So, let's crack on. I will do some sort of intro that I haven't thought of. So.